So hi everyone and welcome to this video, the second video in our module on the basics of the theory of consumer behavior. So in this particular video, we're going to discuss the actions of consumer preferences, at least uh, some of them. So um, we discussed in the introduction in the last video, the first action, which is generally uh, referred to as completeness. And just to recall, we just stated that um, it just means that for all possible pairs of alternative consumption bundles, say you were faced with X prime or X double prime, say a consumer was faced with either one of these two bundles, option one could be that the, the consumer prefers bundle one over bundle two. Another option would be that the consumer prefers bundle two over bundle one. And the third one is the consumer's indifferent between bundle one and bundle two. So in essence, the consumer can always be able, uh, will always be able to give me an answer to my question, which one do you prefer? You can either say you prefer one over two, you prefer two over one, or, you prefer, or you're indifferent between the two, which just means that you're not plagued by indecision. You can always make a decision. You are never paralyzed by indecision. You know exactly which of the three uh, options you will choose. So, and uh, in essence, you uh, we will show later, you have to be consistent with your choosing, with your decision throughout time. Okay, so that's the first action, which is completeness. The second action is called transitivity. And in essence, this is like elementary. So if a consumer prefers one bundle over another and prefers that bundle over another bundle, then obviously the original bundle must also be referred to the third bundle. So, if, if it follows that the consumer prefers X prime to X double prime, and the consumer also prefers X double prime over X triple prime, then by the property of transitivity, it must be that uh, X uh, prime should be preferred to X triple prime by transitivity, right? So that's all that this is saying, okay? so. In essence, in, uh, the consumer's preferences are internally consistent. So when I ask you this decision, okay, choose between one and two, and you say one, and then I ask you this decision separately, which is to compare two and three, and you should choose two, then obviously I could already infer because your uh, preferences should be internally consistent that one should be preferred to three. And that should just follow reasonably from that, um, from that assertion. So in ranking order or in rank ordering bundles, when you rank which one you prefer, most prefer, which one you least prefer, the consumer possesses an ordinal measure of utility. No, this is a key concept, which I will stress in the class. The measure of utility is a mere ordinal measure, okay? He need not be able to assign numbers that represent the amount or intensity of satisfaction. And this is construed as sort of magnitude, okay? So the utility measure that we will compute generally in this class doesn't imply magnitude. So say I have a utility value of five and a utility value of 10. Uh, so this is associated with bundle two, this is with bundle one. Then I can say that I would more likely prefer the second bundle over the first bundle because it gives a higher utility. And that's all I can say about it. I cannot say that I prefer bundle two twice as much as bundle one because 10 is double five, right? That is not the case. Utility is a mere ordinal measure. And this is something I, again, will stress on and on. Utility is a mere ordinal measure, not a cardinal measure. Okay, So it cannot imply magnitude. It can only imply a degree of order. So that's the second assumption. The third assumption is for ease and mathematical um, sort of uh, uh, ease, as I said, is continuity. And it just states that if the consumer reports that he prefers X prime to X double prime, then consumption bundles that are suitably close to bundle one must also be preferred by the consumer to bundle two. So if you say that you prefer X prime to X double prime, then likely there exists a bundle, say X triple prime, which you may be indifferent to with X prime that you would uh, say 
okay, that you prefer x triple prime to x double prime. So that's all it's saying. If x triple prime is suitably close or will make it indifferent compared to bundle one, then likely uh, that will also uh, make you, uh, you would prefer that bundle over the original bundle, bundle two, which you, uh, which you didn't prefer over bundle one. So this assumption is just necessary if you wish to analyze the consumer's responses to relatively small changes in income and prices, i.e. when we start to do differentiation and we start to derive these things in actual, using actual math. So um, this assumption okay, also rules out certain kinds of discontinuous preferences that pose problems from our mathematical theory standpoint. So things like love, et cetera, those things are kind of hard to model uh, because there's likely discontinuities in there. So we'd like to have continuous preferences such that we can derive it at any point and get the values that we would want. So it's more a mathematical easing function. The next uh, axiom is called non-cessation or monotonicity. And it just means that it is reasonable to assume that the consumer always prefers more to less. Okay, that is, he will always prefer a bundle with more of at least one good and none less of the others. So this implies that the consumer will never be completely satisfied, i.e. what we refer to as the term non-sachated. So say I was given with a bundle wherein I have five units of X1, six units of X2, and I have another bundle which is um, seven units of X1 and six units of X2. Note that both bundles have the same amount of X2, Therefore, by the assumption of non-satiation, I would obviously prefer the second bundle to the first bundle because it has more of at least one good with none less of the other, right? So that's this assumption of non-satiation. You always prefer a bundle with a higher amount of one good, none less the other. The consumer will not be completely satisfied. So any, say I had a third bundle, and this was say 10, and this is six, then of course I would prefer that over the second bundle. So that is our assumption on non cessation or monotonicity. The last action of consumer preferences is a little bit uh, trickier, but I think nevertheless relevant, and that is strict convexity. And according to strict convexity, the consumer prefers averages to extremes, okay? That is, the consumer prefers average consumption bundles versus extreme consumption bundles. So what do I mean by this? Say we have a bundle we're in say uh, X prime and then say good one is, um, uh, say good one is like, uh, let's say burgers, burgers. X two is like um, say some other good say uh, candy, right? Say a candy, right? So uh, it, uh, it, it would most likely be the case that if I had three bundles, okay, if I had three bundles, okay, bundle one, say, contains 10 units of burger and only one candy. This one contains one burger and 10 candy. This one contains an average of the two, which is like five, five. Okay, so I would likely prefer bundle three, okay, compared to bundle one and two, because bundle one is extreme in burgers. So bundle one extreme in burgers. Bundle two is extreme in candy. And then you can sort of think, although we will formalize this in another video, that your X triple prime is like an average of the two bundles. So not as much um, burgers as bundle one, just enough like five, and not as much candy as bundle two, maybe just five, but it contains more candies than bundle one and more burgers than bundle two. So it's like your middle ground. And in general, people tend to prefer middle things or balanced things or a balanced, let's say in this case, sort of a diet or a balanced consumption plan than those extreme consumption plans. So that's the assumption of strict convexity. And those are the general assumptions of consumer preferences. So that's it for this particular video. In the next video, we're going to discuss how the utility function, how we actually uh, associate some mathematical uh, measure of happiness into the utility function, which we refer to as the utility function. We're going to discuss how that's derived in the assumptions that goes with that and how it mirrors 
the actions we discussed in this particular video. So thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much.